Is corruption in the government bringing on the end of the world? My guest today, WCPA member guest investigator, Gary Kaw, can tell us firsthand. I'm Drenda, and this is Drenda On Guard. Let's get into it. We must stand up. There are answers. We declare a war on sadness, war on sadness, war on sadness, sadness, war on sadness. Self-made gods are nice things to have around until people actually start to need God. And that's what's happening in our culture. We need to do something. We need to say something. We need to stand up, be bold and courageous. You've got to stay on guard. My guest today, Gary Ka, is an award-winning author for his number one Christian bestseller, En Route to Global Occupation, in 1992. Seven years of research went into his writing as he worked with government organizations as founder and executive director of Hope for the World International in Noblesville, Indiana. He's been a member of the World Constitution and Parliament Association since the late 80s and witnessed the world government agenda firsthand. Gary, thank you for being with me today. Hi, Drenda. It's my pleasure. It's good to be with you. I'm so blessed to be able to talk with you and just to hear a little bit about your history. So you were working in government. I know you traveled to over 20 countries. Uh, you were working with embassies and government leaders at the top. And you began to get word of an agenda. What was the agenda you heard? Well, um, there were a number of people that worked at our embassies, which, of course, is under the State Department, um, who I would say were globalists. Um, they were in favor of empowering the United Nations to the point where eventually it would become a type of global government system, of course, at the expense of our national sovereignty. And that concerned me, um, yes. <laughs> especially because of my background and, and what my parents went through uh, during World War II. Uh, they were in Europe and went through the war. And so I was kind of sensitized at a, at a young age, I think, uh, to be aware of certain things. And, and so being now thrust into this uh, government uh, work, I was working for the state government, the state of Indiana. But when I traveled overseas, my meetings were actually organized by the embassies at the federal level. So I got to know people both at the state level as well as uh, at the national level. And um, I did meet some people who were opposed to globalization, uh, but they would have been fewer uh, by quite a bit than those who, who favored it. And that really caught me off guard. I was surprised by that. Wow. So even back in the 80s, you were hearing talk of a new world order. Were they calling it a new world order back then? Uh, they, they referred to it as a global system, a globalization, that type of thing. And I did hear the term the new world order, but not that often. It wasn't until 1992 uh, when President Bush just started talking about it left and right. Then it's as if it, it just brought them all out of the woodwork. Wow. I know I've been researching for a book that I'm releasing soon that deals with the end times and prophetic things. And I got to research these. I was shocked to find out that even after World War I, uh, Woodrow Wilson, they were trying to bring a League of Nations as a, a one world system then, all the way back to the end of World War I. And so this is something I, I say, I think that Satan is the tyrant. All the way back through history, he's tried to establish his world order in the world, Tower, Tower Babel, uh, you know, forward. So now here we are, fast forward. You brought this information up in the 80s to others. How was the, what was the response when you were saying, hey, look, I'm working with these global leaders. They're talking about creating a one world government, probably then under the United Nations. This, it was discussed that way. Correct, correct. Well, I, I made a commitment when I was a young man uh, growing up in Ohio. Um, when I was 11 years old in, in sixth grade, shortly after becoming a Christian, um, and really for the first time getting what happened during World War II and how horrendous it was, and what my parents went through, my father fleeing first from the communists and then the Nazis, uh, wow. for example. And I remember making a commitment sitting in my classroom, Lord, if anything would ever happen in this country, like what happened in Europe, I promise I will take a stand for you no matter the cost. Of course, 
never really thinking that the Lord would pick me up on that one day. Wow. So now fast forward, I'm in this job, I'm learning these things. Um, and what I've shared so far was just, you know, the tip of the iceberg, there was a lot more. And so I began to feel like, Lord, are you taking me up on that commitment I made years ago? And if <laughs> Who does so, that? <laughs> where do I start? You know, I mean, you stand on a street corner and start warning people about the new world order. Probably not. Uh, people would think you're nuts. And so after a couple of weeks of, of prayer, uh, the door opened for me to share at a Bible study group uh, that was led by my very good friend at the time. He was the right hand assistant to Indiana's secretary of state who happened to be a Christian as well. And uh, so I shared at that, at that Bible study group and some of our Christian state legislators uh, were part of that. So then they, they were very interested in this information. They asked me if I would share to some other groups that they were involved in. And so over the course of uh, about 10 months or so, it just happened. I just began uh, talking about this really as the Lord opened the doors and then in April of uh, 1985, I believe it was April 3rd, um, uh, I was called into the office of one of the deputy directors of our Commerce Department. And uh, he asked me to have a seat, which I did. And he said, Gary, is it true that you've been speaking out against world government and that type of thing? And I said, yes, that's that's correct. <laughs> he said, uh, don't you think that this possible trend toward a world government isn't just a natural evolution of the progress of mankind? Wow. Thought, wow, that's a loaded question. So I tackled it <laughs> just as I could. And I began sharing certain things that I could back up because I had already done uh, by that time, uh, you know, some a decent amount of research into the economic and the political side of this. And and so I began to share with him and he he listened for quite a while, actually, uh, for sure, over 20 minutes, maybe a little longer than that. And then he finally cut me off and um, he said, as long as you work for this administration, you will not talk about any of these things to any groups, regardless of their size, whether they are Christian or non-Christian. Is that understood? And before I could even think of a response, he said, uh, you've been a tremendous asset to our administration and we do not want to lose you, but the choice is yours. Wow. So Gosh. you, you were canceled back then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was basically given an ultimatum to keep quiet or, or leave. And it really caught me off guard big time. Um, because I felt, you know, I'm being, uh, careful. I'm being discreet in how I talk about it. I'm not being a loose cannon. Um, I backed up with evidence, the things that I talked about, um, but they would not tolerate it. Now, to be fair, and I want to, I always try to get this in there. Uh, our Lieutenant Governor, who was the Director of the Commerce Department and ultimately my boss, we always got along very well and traveled together overseas on a couple of occasions on trade missions that I actually was the one who set it up and he, he would come with us on those. Um, uh, we ended up on very good terms. So it, it didn't come from him. And it's a bit of a mystery where this ultimatum originated from. But I did find out later on uh, that there were some other leaders in our state government that were very much in favor of this idea of globalization, uh, including uh, our, our governor at the time, I would say, leaned in that direction. So they definitely had some interest in, in putting the kibosh on it. And so I took one more trip overseas, uh, which interestingly, was to Finland, Russia, and China. It was a people-to-people -people group that I had been invited to be part of a delegation uh, that our Secretary of State had organized, and he invited me uh, to go with him. So I thought, I'll take that trip yet and use that as a time to pray, pray and reflect uh, and make sure I make the right decision. And then on the way back, I wrote my letter of resignation. Uh, I gave them three weeks' notice, and uh, and then left my job uh, to research and write full time. Uh, I felt that God was calling me to write a book to really document these things. And that would take some time and commitment. So this was kind of a little nudge that I needed to get me started. <laughs> <laughs> and so you said you saw so many things that this was just the tip of the iceberg. You want to share any of the things that you saw that really uh, awakened you and shook you as you researched what you saw as well? 
Yeah, uh, where to begin? Um, I, I share a few of those in, in my, my book, En Route to Global Occupation. Um, so I won't go in, in a ton of detail on that, but I'll just give you one example that I share in the book. Uh, I was in Taiwan uh, working there, and it wasn't the embassy because officially we don't have an embassy uh, in Taiwan. It's more like a U.S. trade center. Uh, our representatives over there, it's like an embassy. And um, one of the meetings I had uh, with a person who was interested in purchasing some of our medical products from Indiana, uh, he was an American. Uh, he was over there in the Korean War in that part of the world, uh, ended up moving to Taiwan, married a Chinese lady there and stayed and became a very wealthy, successful businessman involved in trade over there. But he was also a member of the Associated Press. And so he was he was very knowledgeable about global events and, and the direction of things. And during our meeting, after we talked about um, uh, trade matters in my job, I forgot to mention my job was to help promote exports from our state of Indiana in order to create more jobs back here on the home front. And, and that's what took me overseas to all these places. And so after we were done talking about uh, that part of it, um, we, we were just kind of feeling each other out a little bit. And I sensed that, that he was pretty conservative. And, um, and so, and, and he would have gotten the same impression from me at that point. And um, uh, he began to talk about certain political uh, developments around the world and, and how really just a, a handful of people, I think he said something like three or 400 people really had the kind of control and power in the world to establish trends. It's not like they could call every single shot, but they could put things in motion that would be very difficult to stop. And so I said, really? Well, tell me about it. And um, long story short, he said, what are you doing tomorrow night? Is there any way you can meet me back here again at the hotel? And so I checked and, and so we set a time where we could meet. And uh, at that time we had a lengthy conversation and he, and he brought with him a list of leaders specifically from the US who were involved at a pretty high level in pushing this agenda toward globalization and one world. And I noticed that uh, all of these people, everyone on the list, I think that I know that I briefly looked at on the spot uh, were members of either uh, the Trilateral Commission or the Council on, Council on Foreign Relations. And many of them were members of both organizations. And so um, that is what really got me started researching those groups, which led me to other things. And, and so I had these, what I now look back upon as being divine appointments uh, wow. through my travels overseas. So it wasn't just what some of the people at the embassies talked about in their overall mindset, but individual people I met through the meetings that were set up. I, I met with a lot of people in um, uh, uh, key business uh, leadership positions in the medical field and also in the energy field. And so that really helped very quickly during the first two to three years on my job uh, to, to, to pique my interest and curiosity. And that led to other things. So, and, and then eventually the biggest things that really happened, uh, one of them was in my last year on my job, I was recruited um, to be part of an organization that I would discover was part of our emergency management network in the US. And today that organization is under the Department of Homeland Security, but this was before Homeland Security was, was founded. And um, so uh, I was uh, in that organization for four years uh, with a certain type of status, which allowed me to attend certain meetings, but not all of them. And then the last three years I was in the organization, I actually had secret clearance. And at that time I was invited to meetings um, in Washington, DC. I was there a couple of times and that it really concerned me uh, at those meetings because the people who briefed us were globalists. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, at one meeting, uh, two guys were uh, in charge of, of, of briefing us one was a prominent member of the Council on Foreign Relations. The other person was a, a type of senior fellow uh, uh, under a fellowship with the Rockefeller Foundation. And if you study globalization, that foundation more than any other has been responsible for funding a lot of these efforts. Yes. <laughs> 
you know, um, and, and they were very clearly globalists. So I wondered what would happen if there was a national emergency? You know, who would be in charge if these people are very pro UN, perhaps at the expense of our national sovereignty? Mm-hmm. And I remember another Christian I met there. Uh, we stumbled onto each other. And at one point during that briefing, he actually leaned over to me and he said, is it just me? Or does it seem as if they're trying to rebuild the Tower of Babel? Yes, they are. Yes. Wow, somebody else gets it. Yes. You know, I'm not the only one. And and then, Drenda, they, they bust us over to the Naval Yard. They're just a couple of miles from the Capitol building for the luncheon. And we were told that the luncheon speaker would be this very important, prominent figure. And his name ended up uh, it, uh, being Leo Churn, who I had never heard of before. Uh, but when they introduced them, it seemed like it took them forever because they listed uh, so many of the awards he'd received from the United Nations and other globalist organizations. And also his biggest claim to fame was that he had served as a key advisor in every administration since World War II, since FDR. Wow. He, they Republican. So he was one of those permanent fixtures in Washington, more or less. He was probably up in his 70s by this time. And among the things that he said was he said that in the United States, in order to be success, successful in the new world order, we needed to move away from our Judeo-Christian ethic wow. and the religious philosophies of the East. Hmm. And he said that not in a kind of um, matter of fact way, like this is the state of the world, but as one who favored that transition. In other words, he was in favor of this. And that also told me that for him to be bold enough to make that kind of statement, he obviously would have had to feel that everybody in the room was pretty much on the same page with him. And um, of course, I wasn't, and at least one other person wasn't. But after he gave that speech, and he said a lot of other controversial things as well, uh, but at the end of his speech, he received a standing ovation. Mm-hmm. And at that point, um, I had to think really quickly, how do I respond? And I do want to stick out like a sore thumb because I, I was, I felt like the Lord had me there in part to see what was going on on, on the end of this. So I stood up, but I couldn't bring myself to clap. I felt that I would be a really a, a traitor to my country and also to the Lord. And um, after that, it, it, things just weren't the same. I, um, um, I was, I was putting pieces together. Actually, what I learned there helped me to further my research uh, because of some of the names of people I, I learned there. And I discovered this thing is even way, mo- way more, way bigger than, than what I ever imagined. And it went to the highest levels of our government. And so these people with this worldview have penetrated uh, the executive branch of our government very heavily. Mm-hmm. Uh, Congress uh, as well, to a large degree. Uh, I found that at the time, um, about 55 to 60 percent of globalists were Democrats, maybe 30, 35 percent Republicans and even a few independents in there. Today, it would be more like about 80 percent of Democrats uh, would favor the globalist agenda and a lesser number, but still a significant number of Republicans as well. So you cannot just go right. straight party thing because they penetrated uh, both sides of it. And someone that doesn't have a Christian worldview, Gary, they're going to think this all sounds wonderful. And you can see why people jump on board to think, well, yes, if we just had, as George Bush said, the rule of law instead of the rule of the jungle, uh, that sounds to the ear. They know how to tickle the ear. They know how to market their uh, utopia to make it sound like it's going to be equity and everybody's going to have freedom and everybody's going to have their needs met. There'll be no world hunger and all these things. It sounds good to the ear, but we know as a Christian in the Christian worldview, we know these things don't end up the way they're presented because sinful man is going to control and dominate and tyranny comes from Satan. And so we know tyranny is along with that agenda, but that's not what others see. They think they're being heroic and altruistic, right? Yeah, exactly. And if you stop to think about it, though, uh, you know, if we have a world government, okay, so who's going to be in charge? If you don't have countries anymore, at least not as we think of them, uh, they'll argue one of the biggest arguments will be we have to have this in order to achieve world peace. 
Because if you have one government over the entire world, in theory, then countries can't fight each other anymore. <laughs> but now you've got all the power at the top, no place left to run to if, if the administration of this world government is bad or evil, because you've put all of your eggs into one basket yes. and you've done away with any kind of system of checks and balances. Right. And, uh, you know, it's very manipulative and they're not they're not stupid. These people are very clever and, and shrewd. And so they're only going to tell us what they want us to think. And uh, so the, the other organization, I said I was in two organizations. One was within our government. One was outside of our government. It was called the World Constitution and Parliament Association. And um, that organization, um, I was affiliated with them for about four years uh, they actually put out a copy of a world constitution, a prototype world constitution for world government. Wow. <laughs> uh, divided the world into, into several uh, regions uh, for ad administration purposes. And I remember they uh, gave us a list of 49 reasons for why we need world government. Mm. This was in the mid to late 1980s. And of those 49 reasons, something like 13 to 15 of them had to do with the environment and ecology. In fact, I heard the term global warming and climate change something like five years before it was ever mentioned publicly, uh, which occurred at the Rio de Janeiro Earth Summit in the early 90s. Uh, and so I, I knew in advance that they were going to use the environmental agenda in a huge way to argue in favor of world government, saying we need to have a world government uh, to rein in uh, the environmental situation and to basically protect us from ourselves. Uh, we need to have a world government to bring about world peace, as I already alluded to. That was one of the other big reasons. Um, and also then to uh, deal with world hunger and also uh, to bring in a new global economic system because our current system was going to collapse. Those were the four big reasons. Wow. And, and we, uh, <laughs> today, you know, and yes, we've got the, the hype over over the environment. Uh, you've got a war in Russia and Ukraine that if it spills over to NATO, you know, could turn into uh, a much broader conflict. Um, uh, we've got uh, the global economy, the economy being threatened as a result of, of this war and the COVID crisis. Inflation is starting to spin out of control. So they have us right where they want things exactly. right now. They're going to keep ramping it up, I believe, over the next couple of years until they finally uh, get us to a certain point where they feel they can effectively make the argument that the old system is broken. Therefore, we have to have a new system and it will be introduced as the cure-all to all of our problems. Right. And then you have Klaus Schwab, who has put together the young global leaders who are now sitting at the heads of all of these major countries uh, and driving the social media. You have people like Zuckerberg and, uh, you know, all of these other people, and even Bezos with an Amazon, who all were part of this young global leaders. They're now in position and power to cover what I call the seven mountains in, in the book I'm writing, the seven Seven mountains of influence so that they're influencing everybody in every direction to be able to take us down this road and this agenda. You've seen it coming. I can't imagine what it would be like to be you, Gary, to have seen this back 30 plus years ago, to have tried to sound the alarm and let people know. And probably people were probably calling you like Chicken Little, you know, saying the sky's falling. When you saw and you knew what was going on, now you see it unfolding before our eyes. How, how does it feel to have watched this journey? But thank God you've been a part of it. God had you there strategically. Well, first of all, I, yeah, I don't want to be prideful with it. Uh, you know, my human side wants to say, I told you I so. Told you you know? so. <laughs> I told you so. Um, but at the same time, I so much rather that none of this was happening, of course. you know, and that's why uh, I did what, what I did and why the Lord led me to uh, take this stand was to warn people uh, to be a type of, of watchman and, and sound the alarm. Um, well, I remember it at the church we were going to at the time um, when I was working you know, for the lieutenant governor in the Commerce Department. Uh, sometimes when people would bring visitors to church, they would track me down. They'd want to introduce me to their friends. As if, you know, here's my friend in this important position. Um, and it, it was kind of obvious. Um, well, once they found I left my job uh, over this matter, 
uh, the same people, sometimes when they'd see me coming, they just kind of slowly turn and walk a different direction. They didn't want to encounter me, but I mean, it was the difference of night and day. And, and, uh, so eventually, uh, we did leave, uh, that congregation and we, we still had good friends there, but we felt we had done what we could and nobody was mean enough to tell me to my face that they thought I was crazy, but you know, mm-hmm. words get back to you of what people really think. Well, now fast forward 30 years later, my wife has bumped into some of these people at the grocery store. They're coming up to her and saying, you know what Gary said in that book he wrote? He was right on. This is for real. This is all happening. It's like, yeah, yeah, you know, it is. And and I mean, I documented things thoroughly. I, I have pages of documentation on the stationery of some of these organizations in, in both of my books. So I thought if I had the evidence, why not put it in front of people? So really people were without excuse, but it, it's just so hard for them to believe. And, and the media is partly responsible, uh, Drenda, you know, with yes. the conspiracy theory. Mm-hmm. But guess what? Yesterday's conspiracy theories have become today's headlines. Absolutely. See, a majority of, of the, the big theories that were going around have proven to be true. Some, some weren't because people, there will always be people who sensationalize things. And it's unfortunate because then it makes it difficult for those of us that are really trying to lay out the, the truth and, and warn people in a credible way. And right. so anyway. Can, can I throw some conspiracy theories at you and just get your take on each of them? Sure. Just a little synopsis. So is there an international sex trafficking ring? Is it related to the government uh, utilizing children and uh, child porn? I believe there is. I've spoken to enough people, credible people that have shared some things in the past, some of them even feeling their life could be in danger for doing so. Uh, have I taken the time and, and committed the resources to that I would like to really get to the bottom of the whole thing? I have not, uh, but I've learned enough that I believe there is such a thing underway. And something I learned um, from being in some of the circles of the globalists is that they like to have something on someone that gets promoted to higher levels to make sure that they do their bidding Control. as they get into these positions. And so I think that's why, for example, uh, uh, Bill Clinton multiple times was a Jeffrey uh, on Jeffrey Epstein's Epstein's Island. Island. Who knows what all went on there, but we have pretty good idea of what went on there and many other politicians as well. And so once that's happened, they've got something on them. And so if any of these people were to ever get to, to the point where they have an epiphany where they realize, you know what? this is all really bad. I should be exposing this rather than being part of it. Mm. Well, they're going to do that at their own risk and and they'll be taken out pretty quickly. I mean, maybe quite literally, but at least um, they'll be um, ostracized, discredentialized, they're idiots, they're conspiracy theorists, which leads me to the other question. And you pretty much answered it. And that is, are there members of Congress uh, by and large that have been compromised or being controlled by those that are in elitist positions who want them to speak and say as their puppets uh, what they want them to do? I believe that's the case. Um, And really, if you want to know who they are, um, get a current uh, copy, and you can do it, uh, of uh, members of some of these organizations, the Council on Foreign Relations, the Trilateral Commission, the World Economic Forum, uh, all those influences uh, with the internationalists, people tightly identified with the Rockefeller and Carnegie Foundations, Ford Foundations, the Gates Foundations, generally they're globalists. Now, I don't want to use too broad of a, of a brush because there are the way these organizations work, you don't have to be one of them initially to come on board, sometimes they'll bring you on board in order to try to influence you, yes. to bring yes. you along in their direction and make you one of them. And I believe that was the case with me. I got invited in because they just assumed that being the Europe and Middle East trade specialist for the state of Indiana, traveling overseas, dealing with our embassies and with the European background, you know, the son of immigrants, all that put together, I could see how they would think, okay, this guy's a globalist, you know? And, and so I, I was pretty quiet about where I stood early on uh, because I was learning a lot and I wanted to learn more. And so I was asked, I was the one asking a lot of the questions and uh, somewhat amazed at what 
some people would share with me about their positions, actually. Um, and so when you see somebody in the Council on Foreign Relations, it doesn't automatically mean that they're part of the one world agenda. But I would look at how long they've been in the organization and then whatever statements they've made. Do they line up with a globalist worldview or you know, more of a patriotic worldview. But I think anybody who's been in the organization for a period of time would have major problems and would have to at some point get out of it or be involved in, in exposing it. Uh, because for all practical purposes, um, if I remember correctly, I'm just going by my memory. It's all it's in my book and Roots of Global Occupation. Uh, but under FDR, uh, there was a committee formed. Uh, it was called the, the Post-War Foreign Policy Committee which would map out what organization would be founded after World War II to move us in the direction of globalization. And that committee, uh, which had, I believe, 14 people, 10 of them, as I recall, were members of the Council on Foreign Relations. And it was that group that laid out really the, the formative details of the United Nations. So for all practical purposes, the UN was a brainchild of the Council on Foreign Relations. Mm -hmm. And you had uh, the Rockefeller Foundation and other foundations helping to fund uh, the Council on Foreign Relations. And guess what? The Rockefellers donated the land upon which the yes. UN is. Yes, the UN. right there in Manhattan, they donated the property. And and the interesting thing, it was a swamp at the time, but once the, they built up the land and the UN was located there, then all the land around there that they also owned uh, went through the roof in value. And so they, they made plenty of money off of that. They mm. always do. now. But if you follow the money trail, you, you'll be able to connect a lot of the dots. And it's the same way with, with the members of Congress. Wow. So my next thought is, um, so we talked about these people and what they're trying to do. They're trying to do the Tower of Babel all over, bring one world government. You and I know as believers, Satan is at the crux. He is at the beginning of, he is the one that's original. Right. They think they're brilliant and they have this great idea. They've just chosen to be on the wrong side of the battle, right? This battle has been raging since Satan was cast from heaven. So tell me this, do you see satanic, occultic influence? Because many I've heard say uh, that there's occultic worship involved with many government offices and people, and they're part of different kinds of things like Bohemian Grove or different kinds of things that have occultic roots and are blatant in some situations. Did you see any of that? Particularly, I'm thinking of the uh, one gentleman, Aquino, that was an open Satanist and a master. Yeah. Um, well, even at the state level, I was surprised to find out how many of our leaders, including one who's a former Presbyterian minister, uh, who eventually took on a key political position, um, had their psychics that they regularly consulted. That really threw me for a loop. And one of these psychics was introduced on a local um, television program once as being a witch. And she said, pardon me, I am not a witch. I am a sorceress. It actually said that. I mean, it, it was so blatant. I, I, I could hardly believe it. And, and so that opened up the whole religious side of this because I had come to understand this is a clash of two worldviews, you know, yes. the Judeo-Christian yes. worldview and then the uh, ultimately the, the satanic uh, worldview that wants to bring us all to a false kind of unity so that Satan can control the world, exactly. uh, which really would lead to uh, the Antichrist taking his stand. And of course, it falls right in line with the scripture. warnings of scripture. Yeah. And yeah. so as I look more and more into it, I, I realized that the, the politics and the economics were being driven by really a spiritual motivation, a very dark motivation. And if I may, um, we just put out this, we, we do a quarterly to keep people up to date and it's called the Hope for the World Update. Awesome. And people can subscribe to this uh, at our website, garycaw.org. Right. Um, right. The recent one that we put out, as you can see from the title, uh, on the brink of World War III, question mark. Yes, that's uh, what we're all wondering, right? <laughs> regarding what's taking place in Russia and Ukraine right now. And so um, in there, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna quote here. It's the quickest way I can do sure. it. I think you'll find this quite interesting. Um, uh, and, and I talked about how the League of Nations uh, was formed right on the heels of World War I. And it was kind yes. of the first step toward a global organization. Then World War II led to the forming of the United Nations, a much bigger step toward global government. 
And I go on to say, given this obvious trend of major conflicts leading to globalization in the name of world peace and unity, could a third world war finally push the globalist agenda over the top? Powerful men led along by demonic spirits have been setting the stage for many decades, yes. catering yes. wittingly or unwittingly to Satan's final deception of humanity. In a letter to the Italian revolutionary leader, Giuseppe Mazzini, dated August 15th of 1871, Albert Pike, the leader of the Illuminist activities in the United States and the head of Scottish Rite Freemasonry at the time, described a distant final war which he felt would be necessary to usher in the new world order. According to Pike, this conflict between, between two future superpowers would be sparked by first igniting another crisis. He wrote, and now this is his quote directly from him. Pike says, we shall unleash the nihilists and the atheists, and we shall provoke a great social cataclysm which in all its horror will show clearly to all nations the effect of absolute atheism, the origin of savagery and of most bloody turmoil. Then everywhere, the people forced to defend themselves against the world minority of revolutionaries will exterminate those destroyers of civilization and the multitudes disillusioned with Christianity, whose deistic spirits will be from that moment on without direction and leadership, anxious for an ideal, but without knowledge where to send their adoration, will receive the true light through the universal manifestation of the pure doctrine of Lucifer brought finally out into public view, a manifestation which will result from a general reactionary movement, which will follow the destruction of Christianity and atheism, both conquered and exterminated at the same time. End quote. Wow. Wow. Well, I heard about the Illuminati, but I've never heard that quote. That's like he's sat Satan being channeled right through him. Satan speaking right through him, his entire plan, which the, the book of Revelation lays out for us clearly too. Yeah, that's right. And Albert Pike, um, what, he had a brilliant mind, oh. but even in, in an evil sense, he spoke or wrote 16 different languages. Um, he could interpret Egyptian hieroglyphics. He was into the ancient mystery religions of, of Babylon, Egypt, Assyria, and so forth. And all the things that we as Christians would see as being negative and occultic, he saw as positive. So if you look at his book, Morals and Dogma, that he wrote, an 861-page book that in high Freemasonry is almost viewed as, as their Bible of sorts. Um, he had dozens and dozens of quotes uh, involving uh, Gnosticism and Kabbalism and the ancient mystery religions. Wow promoting all of them as being good. And so also the building of the Tower of Babel was viewed as being a good development. And his goal and the goal of, of high Freemasonry and the new age movement is to get the world back to that point, uh, trying to restore the, the time of the Tower building of, of the Tower of Babel, this, this unity. But guess what? God was the one who intervened and broke it up because he didn't want there to be one individual ruling over the entire known world. And, you know, history. Because God knew who it would be. It would be Satan deceiving exactly. man, just like he deceived woman and man in the garden. The same right. voice would be speaking through governments, through people, because without that check and balance, as we were talking about early in the heart of men, power, women, sex, power, sex, uh, money, those, those three big things are going to control people's hearts and minds, and it's too much. Even we see it with Christian leaders who fall prey to those where Satan comes in there and uses that to lure them in, no differently than what you were talking about, how Jeffrey Epstein's island was used to control and manipulate and get something on people. Uh, Jesus said, Satan has nothing on me, but most anyone else, obviously, nobody else in, in not being perfect, uh, it, some level of power, some level of money, some level of influence can be bought into our, our, our you know, compromised and then uh, the enemy has something in them. And there we go. They, they control the right. tyranny, the power. They become puppets. And now we're in the latter stages of, of seeing this all come together. You know, and at some point, um, maybe 
sooner rather than later, um, we're going to see a global system come together and there will be a global ruler. Uh, the Bible refers to him as the Antichrist, the beast, the lawless one. And guess who's going to come and put a stop to it? It will be Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> And so we see in the Bible, the reason I bring that up is God broke up the building of the Tower of Babel because it would be dangerous. He did it for the sake of mankind. And in, the, in Christ's second coming, same thing. It will be the Lord himself uh, who has to be the one to break it up because uh, Satan will have such a, a lock of control, politically speaking, on people that uh, it will require the return of Jesus to put a stop to it. And fortunately, we have that promise in Scripture. Yes, we do. <laughs> And that's the good news. Now, between now and then, you know, there are going to be some difficult times and we've got to be bold and strong as Christians and and walk more closely with with the Lord than we ever have before and and really uh, draw near to him. Because um, if not, I I think people are going to be so confused, uh, disillusioned, taken aback by by what is coming, especially people in the West who've had it pretty easy. You know, we really. Wow. You are so, you are so affirming everything, Gary. I've written in my book and I've only known about you for two weeks, but I'm so glad to know you because you have to know, I don't have the experience background you have, but as I've seen these things play out as a mother, as a wife, as a leader, as a pastor, uh, and also prophetically uh, motivated throughout my life, I was pulled aside in school and made the governor's honors program and they wanted to get their best, their brightest in the school and then indoctrinate them to, you know, road scholarships and to go on to become their voices. And so I've watched and seen that and have, have seen these plans, but it still takes a step of boldness to try to declare these things to people, to write it in books, to, you know, to get people even still now saying conspiracy theory and what are you talking about? And it's just, uh, it's interesting how the enemy has played this same tune over and over, but you have the legs and the background to stand on to say, hey, I've seen this from here to today, and I know what's going on. And Daniel, it says that God's kingdom, Jesus' kingdom, will crush, the stone will crush all the other kingdoms of this world. And we believe that. We know that that's our hope. We know he did it in his first coming, but he's really going to do it and put a final, he did it spiritually the first coming, but the second coming is going to be a uh, physically crush these kingdoms of the world. But I do want to ask you what believers can do because there are believers who'll take the stand. Well, this is in the Bible anyway. It's going to happen. The spirit of Antichrist has been here. It's going to be the Antichrist. And they want to sit back and go, it's just, you know, that's just the way it is. But that's not what God, God's word tells us to do. What would you say to believers to be doing? And I do share the same concerns you have about the West, about we've had it easy. Uh, we've had people come in our church from Russia, from Ukraine, from all over the world, from places. I've traveled to Moldova. I've seen Albania where the atheists used to rule them and put them in barrels if they were Christians and throw them in the ocean. I've seen those people. I've seen the pain. I've seen the suffering. Then I come home and I look at America and it looks like with what our nation is doing, our leaders right now, that they're trying to compromise us to such a great degree to weaken us, to destroy uh, American values, our constitution, and bring us, you have to destroy America in order to get a one world because America yeah. is too strong of a power, too independent, our constitution. It looks like that is exactly what this administration is doing and all of the cohorts and their connections with the Green and the Green New Deal and all of these things they're throwing yeah. at us. What do believers do in this hour to keep themselves strong? And what should we be doing instead of sitting back and going, oh, it's just going to happen? 